Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. We are in a totally different place. Finally, we have escaped our prison. Um, probably not a real prison, but I hope our boss is not watching. Uh, anyway, so good to see you. Happy, happy Saturday. Um, it's a good holiday yesterday, and I hope that you all are enjoying yourself. Hello, Ian. Hello, Chef Rest. Hey, Julius. Hey, Ian. Hey, yes. hey Chef Rest. Good day to you guys, too. All right. This is, uh, you know, part of our celebration of uh, International Women's Day. Uh, it's probably an International Women's Month right now. Uh, in any event, uh, we are more than happy to, you know, bring in some of our speakers. As usual, if you are interested, uh, come submit your COFA papers. Uh, we'll be more happy to uh, put you uh, and chat with us as well. All right, let's uh, roll. Um, awesome. Thanks, Julius. Thanks, Veyuan. Thanks for organizing this event. Um, hi, everyone. Hope all of you are having a very good Saturday morning today. And um, it's exciting to be a part of uh, the Big O, the new uh, event series that uh, Julius and uh, Veyuan is hosting. And today, um, and we are pretty excited to have uh, two very uh, influential email, um, uh, I would say, people from tech, uh, tech are going to share some of their interesting stories today. Uh, so we are very excited to hear what they have to share with all of you. Um, so my name is Shafraz. I am part of uh, Google Developer Relations team here in Singapore. And uh, we are really excited about the event for today. Um, so why am I here? It's to give an introduction to uh, the developer space, because developer space is being um, helping out develop, uh, the developer communities to host um, activities virtually uh, through their platform, through their channel, and also they help out with in multiple ways so that uh, the communities can thrive and also we can empower communities at scale as well. Uh, before we begin, let me brief introduction about virtual developer space and what we do. Uh, Google uh, Developer Space is a platform for developers and startups around the region to learn and connect with one another. Uh, we have a physical space here in Singapore office, but Due to COVID-19, uh, we moved everything online. And I'm pretty sure Julius and Bayu and the rest of the crowd are super excited to be at the physical space like very soon as well. Um, and we regularly host um, events online with developers and startup communities. And we're really looking forward to um, today's session as well. So do keep in touch with the developer space, um, social media, um, handles and also if you can see there's this website as well where you can see all the upcoming events which are being updated um, too. So without taking much time, I've been uh, like uh, I just uh, jumped into this call to give like an introduction. But this is Julius and Rayuan's event and we have some amazing speakers uh, online as well. Without taking much time, let me hand it over to Julius and Rayuan. Thank you, Shafras. All right. I uh, also wanted to thank, you know, all these communities who have been so passionate to, you know, share our events, publish our events. Uh, we hope that, uh, you know, we can continue to partner with you. Uh, and if you're from uh, any other communities as well, uh, we'd like to talk to you. We are from Google Developer Group, as always. Uh, there's the email. Please uh, reach out to us. We're more than happy to connect with you. Uh, all right, uh, as usual, we want followers. It's super cool to have followers. Um, please subscribe. We are at uh, Google Developer Spaces channel. Uh, please do subscribe to their channel as well to get informed with, you know, they have a lot of events, like a lot of events. Um, so please, you know, subscribe and, uh, you know, learn, learn more about, you know, various stuff that they talk about. They have startup chat. They have, uh, uh, like, I think there's going to be a Go event and a data science event soon. Uh, also an Android event um, coming in a few days. Um, so we're looking forward to that as well. And uh, here are some uh, developer spaces, uh, uh, community, how should I say, uh, social media. Uh, so please do uh, follow, please do subscribe, blah, 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 you know the stuff. And um, yeah, we're supposed to live stream to uh, all of these uh, channels as well. Uh, so if you are from Philippines, Singapore, uh, please do, um, you know, support you know, the country's uh, GDG. And 
Ta-da! So, um, back in August, we invited Bruce Wang, and uh, one of the uh, questions was, why don't we have the Netflix sound? Ta-da! So, we're probably going to have it next uh, event. Uh, in any event, um, Bruce Wang will be back. He'll be talking about uh, another topic, which I think uh, is very important for, you know, engineers, um, PMs perhaps, you know, uh, how to actually move up the career ladder and uh, kind of see how things might look like from us. It's interesting because uh, after in interviewing a lot of uh, engineers in uh, Singapore, uh, it turns out that there's something that uh, in particular Singapore, um, people really think about it. So please do uh, support us and uh, we hope to see you in two weeks time. Next, when you wish upon a star, uh, we're going to have another person uh, all the way from Disney streaming. So there's, there's a lot of streaming stuff recently, isn't it? Um, so we're going to have uh, Anastasia. Um, she's still preparing her topic, but we are very excited to announce her topic very soon. Um, so please follow, up, follow us in social media and um, uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, that will be in May 8th. All right. Um, we want speakers, we want you, we want to talk to you, um, you know, and if uh, you're one of, one of those uh, who wants to share something, not really sure, or like uh, it's your first time to share, you know, a bit, um, how should I say, scared, got stage fright and so forth, uh, we are more than happy to help you out. Uh, please sign up um, through the link below. We'll, we'll be happy to uh, have you talk about Android, Kotlin, Google Cloud, um, you know, Google, uh, actions at Google, you know, like that's something that uh, not a lot of people talk about. Um, so we'll be more than happy to have you as well uh, share those. All right. Dun, dun, dun. Um, yeah, let me pass it on to Wei Yan to share a bit more about our sponsor for the day. Thanks, Julius. Uh, so, yep, for those who have been tuning into our uh, events uh, for the past few months, I think most of you would have seen that uh, our regular event sponsor or rather the venue sponsor has been uh, mostly at Harbour. Today, we're actually very, very excited to have been invited to do this event in a different office. It's uh, actually a very, very cool space. Maybe you, if we can, we can like show you guys a bit more of the venue later or maybe try social or something uh, similar to that. But yeah, uh, just to very quickly introduce uh, the company itself, I think some of you all might have heard of this startup, uh, BeLife. They are founded in uh, 214 Singapore. They have uh, employees over many different countries. And yeah, the... Their service itself, uh, uh, three main, uh, what do you call it, main faculties or the, the uh, pinnacle points for their services. I think some of you, if you are uh, frequent users on social media, some of you might have uh, already like seen uh, their applications being used in different places. But I think there's one influencer that I saw uh, using one of these applications. I believe her name is Pei Shi. Like, so yeah, local influencers, I think for Singaporeans, some of you might know. For I think other countries like Taiwan, for example, maybe you guys would have seen some of them there as well. So do support them. Uh, venue very very cool place. And uh, not sure if it's actually a team here, but some of them might have uh, observed that like our uh, next two events, those are like from uh, kind of like streaming platforms. And then now we have like a sponsor from streaming. Uh, very interesting uh, correlation there, though not intended. Uh, but yeah, as always, um, if you guys are interested in looking to sponsor our events like, or things like event sponsors, you know, do let us know. I think just now we also show our uh, uh, the, the email, uh, Singapore GDG. Like later, you'll be able to see that as well. Do contact us. Let us know, you know uh, if you guys want to help support our, some of our events. And without further ado, I think let's uh, jump into the heat of today's events. Like this is why you guys are here for. You know, we want to uh, get to know our speakers better and understand from their experiences how they transited from uh, their previous industries, you know, from being an architect into an actual software architect. And, you know, this is very, very big domain jumps. Uh, so let's bring them in uh, and then they'll, uh, we can get them to introduce themselves. Hey, welcome, Eunice Akshata. Hello. Hi. Okay, so uh, I think let's start with, uh, I guess, an uh, introduction and uh, slides from one of the speakers first. Okay, I'll go first. Hey, everyone. I'm Mark Shapa. I am a senior software engineer at Rocket and Wiki. Uh, Julius and Vian were ex colleagues of mine at Rocket and and I moved over from architecture to software engineering officially about two and a half years back. 
which is what I'll be sharing on later. So hello, I'm Eunice. I am a product manager at Hubble. So I am, of course, where you and Julius are in the right? They are my current colleagues. So um, I'm here to share about my experience about transiting into um, tech from architecture. So in fact, I actually made this jump to go from um, working in the construction industry to tech one year ago. So it's been a very painful jump. Thankful to have these two guys with me. So that's what I'll be sharing on later. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, shall we start with the uh, talks for today? Sounds good. Let's start in alphabetical order. Thank you. Akshata, thank you. Uh, okay, Eunice will go to the background first. Um, and uh, let's roll. Okay, thanks, Julius. Uh, hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in on a, Tuesday, on a Saturday morning. And today I'm going to be connecting the dots in my journey from architecture to software engineering. So a bit more than the, introdu than the introduction that I gave earlier. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at Rakuten Tenviki. Before this, I was doing research at NUS in the design automation lab. And I'm an architect turned developer, which is why we are here. In my previous life, I was trained to build buildings. My task was to reimagine the world around us, the walls, the spaces. I would doodle on butter sheets, napkins, and I would work with construction project managers, real estate people, uh, interior designers, etc. Today, I build software. I still reimagine the world, only that it's the virtual world. I doodle, but on VS Code. And I work with product managers, UX designers, and data engineers. If you look at it, architecture and computer engineering are kind of similar. They're both about building things. The tools are different. The constraints are different. But it's still building for real people and building for convenience, practicality, and pleasure. So the transition from architecture to software engineering is pretty straightforward. I'm just kidding. It took me about eight years, and it looked more like this. So let me tell you my story. In 2011, I was a second year architecture student, and I got an internship with this company called Value and Budget House Incorporation in India. And what they were doing was they were making budget houses. And the, the way they were doing it was by using a lot of cutting edge construction technology and building fast. The vision was great. The leadership was inspiring. But the best part was that it was in Bangalore, where the legal drinking age was 18. And they were paying me $300 a month. So I was happy. I happily hopped up to Bangalore. I was starry-eyed. But then, as we all know, or what you get is grunt, I mean, intern work. And my job was to convert construction drawings into 3D building models. And since most of their housing was standardized, this was a lot of repetitive work with very little changes. So I was getting bored. And in one of my procrastination binges on Google, I came across something called the Revit API, which basically allowed me to add custom functionality into the software that I was working with to build the 3D models. As they say, need is the mother of all inventions. So I came up with something like this. I broke down the buildings into smaller blocks, like Lego blocks. And I put a Windows form on it to bring it all together with the click of a button. So now the <clears throat> so now what would uh, what would have taken the poor intern, which was me, a couple of days per drawing could now be done with a single click. And this was great. Uh, my boss was happy. I was happy. I didn't do anything else the rest of the internship, and I basically had the, had had the most fun time in Bangalore. But the most interesting bit was. I stumbled upon this middle ground between architecture and computer science called computational architecture. And this middle ground had a lot of special specializations. There was building information modeling, energy modeling, parametric design, IoT for buildings, building management systems. It was a niche, and I recognized that, and I decided to build on it. 
So for my third year internship, I went to QUT in Australia in the Institute of Future Environments. I was exposed to a lot of things like AI and architecture, building schemas. Then my fourth year, I interned in Across Beyond, which was a full stack construction company. And they had an in-house software company building their own software tools for BIM for construction management. This is where I got exposed to full stack software applications. And finally, I landed up in NUS in the design automation lab, where I was the tech lead for uh, Mobius, which is a coding tool for architects, and StudioNet, which is uh, which was a graph-based social community. And at the end of at, and since research takes time, and research has a lot of potential for procrastination, as and is also initiative driven. As a hobby, I took up doing MOOCs. I binged watched on Coursera, Udacity, Free Code Camp. I was doing courses on Agile, UI, UX, product management, Android, AI, anything that would keep me engaged. And at the end of three years at NUS, I was thinking of going back into the industry. And I realized that from an architect, I'd become more of a specialty architect. I had a degree in architecture, but I also had a skill set, which is I knew how to apply computing to architecture. And that made me eligible for a different set of roles. And then it made me question, do I really want to be an architect? I, re I realized that I enjoyed the software engineering part of it a lot more than I did the AI, uh, the art, the construction applications part of it. So at that point, I said, no, I think I'm going to be a software engineer from now. At this point of time, I was fairly comfortable programming. I'd built a couple of projects end to end. I was tech lead at the design automation lab. But as usual, enter imposter syndrome. I had a bad bout of anxiety. I was very conscious of the fact that I didn't have an undergraduate degree in computer science. I hadn't worked for a traditional technology company. And I thought maybe I didn't know what real coding was. My brain already thought in code. So I decided to take an if else approach to it. I decided that I would start interviewing for software engineering jobs for six months. If I got a job, then I would celebrate, get drunk, and say yay. Otherwise, I would think about going back to school. Thankfully, the else path never got triggered. I did get a job. And I've been happily ever after at Rakuten Wiki since then. So making these slides about my journey, I reflected on them and I was trying to connect some dots. And I figured out that there were some things that I was doing which worked for me. In retrospect, I was probably not doing them consciously, but they did help me on. So the first thing is that I was constantly reacting and solving. I didn't have an abstract vision for myself. I didn't have a big shot goal about five years. I was just trying to solve my immediate pain point in my current context. As they say, there's no better motivation than your own misery. So the projects that I actually ended up uh, finishing and getting traction for were the ones that were solving problems for me and the people around me. The next thing was that I kept moving. I started off with C Sharp, trying to build the plugin in my first internship. Then I went through stacks which used PHP, JavaScript, Go, Java. The world said mobile is the next big thing, so I learned how to make Android applications. By the time I finished that, they said AI is the next big thing, so I learned how to do AI. None of which that I use today in my current job, but all of which I feel have helped me become a better engineer. So no one knows the correct way anyway. The only way is the way forward. And finally, I was enjoying myself. At a point of time where I was really anxious and I didn't know where my career was going, what my direction was, the only thing that I could fall back on was the fact that I actually got happiness from getting a little bit of code to execute. And that micro happiness helped me focus on the attitude rather than my ability. It was OK for me to fail, because I knew even in the failing, I would learn something about something that I liked doing. In our philosophy, let's get back to the real world. And here are a couple of tips if you're looking to break into tech. 
So firstly, where do you learn from, which is, as usual, Google. For me, I learned a lot from Free Code Camp, Udacity, and Coursera also. Copy from Stack Overflow. It's OK to be a code monkey initially. I would keep copying. And finally, I copied the first time, second time, third time, fourth time, it started to click. Or somebody came out and made me feel bad about the fact that I didn't understand my code. And then I was forced to understand what it was. Then do a lot of projects. The best ideas for projects are from your own domain. That's what you get the most traction and motivation for. The fourth thing is freelance. I did a couple of freelance projects on the way, and they gave me a lot of validation for my skill set. Because that's what a software engineer is. You're getting paid to code. If somebody is willing to pay you, that means you're somewhere there. Then find a tribe, network, and meet people on similar journeys as you. For me, one of the early influencers was this other colleague of mine who was trying to make the journey the other way. He was moving from computer engineering to architecture. And his perspectives gave me a lot of insight that I might not have received from those immediately around me with the same background. Then if you're looking to interview, familiarize yourself with the interview process. That's one of the mistakes I made initially. I didn't go in with enough preparation, and I have suffered from a lack of confidence after that. But if you're in Rome, do as Romans know the rules that you're playing by. And finally, think in small steps, break it down. It's probably a more general thing, but we all have problems. Sometimes they're big. And for me, it would get overwhelming at times. I would start off with these huge, vis huge visions about, OK, in two years, in five years, in three years. But what eventually worked was, what am I doing today? What am I doing tomorrow? And what am I doing in the next five days? I'm going to end with one of my favorite quotes, which is, change is the only constant in life. And that's all from me today. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Akshata. That was a very informative uh, talk. Um, and uh, we have uh, a bit of questions, actually, but we were thinking to kind of save it all the way to the end. Um, so we uh, kind of end both talks with a party of questions. Thank you so much. Uh, cool, cool. All right. Ta -da! Hello, Eunice. It's your time to shine. OK, let's, uh, <laughs> let's show you this slide. All right. So hello. Um, so I'm Eunice, product manager earlier mentioned. So um, what I want to share about today is my jump and shift you know, from construction to product. I would say my experience compared to Akshata is quite different, mainly because um, I didn't have this gradual um, growth and learning to um, kind of gravitate towards tech. But essentially, it's more of like my observations at work and how it actually made me think and reflect on, you know, could tech make my life better as an architect, right? So that's why I ended up here. So um, I want the next slide. So yes, I want to share a little bit more about my company because I guess it has some context to why I am doing tech. So I'm working in this company, Hubble, uh, together with Julius and Wayne currently. And we are an award-winning one-stop construction management digital platform, something I just ripped off the company website. So essentially what our company does is uh, we do you no know, construction tech and uh, kind of try to streamline construction processes that you know happen um, from the I would say wouldn't say the start of a construction project, but you not know, as much as we can cover in terms of construction project processes. Um, between the different stakeholders, which includes the developers, the consultants, main contractors, subcontractors, suppliers, and that's pretty much uh, where we want to be at, um, linking up the different stakeholders as well as, you know, down to the last man, you know, the worker, and um, the, the you know, different things in terms of time, tasks, and how they are being handled in construction. So this is where I felt a lot of passion for, that's why I ended up here. So to share a little bit more about myself, I am a product manager at Hubble. So uh, I have previously worked as an architect in Singapore. I have worked for about four to five years in architecture. I have a master's in architecture, a bachelor's in architecture as well. I'm a registered architect in the world of architects. And I think the question I get regularly is, you know, um, if you're a registered architect, why would you actually make that change? 
given that you can actually earn more now, you can actually be signing off drawings now, people trust you to do things now, why would you actually make this shift? So I would say at this point, uh, for me, it was kind of like, um, uh, how would I put it? It was, it was more like uh, having to make a shift I would say, you know, I wouldn't say it's for the greater good, but it's for the greater good of my own future if I was to stay in architecture as well, or in the building industry. Reason being, uh, construction industry is kind of like the second least digitized industry. And, you know, there's so much things that can be done if digitization takes place and things are made more efficient. Yes, there's a lot of softwares around, you know, authoring softwares that we do, like uh, Ashata mentioned earlier, parametric modeling. There's so much interesting things going on in terms of the design space. But in terms of the processes that happen um, in architecture, which um, most of it is an architect you deal with on site, um, dealing with paperwork that does not deal with, you know, essentially the, the fun and uh, fanciful part of doing the beautiful modeling, um, creating things that you have to make your structural engineers figure out how to make them constructed and built. So uh, that's kind of how I fell into this space to think perhaps, you know, with my experience, and with my uh, understanding, I'm actually kind of keen to see how I could help uh, digitize the industry together. So to share some of these things, you know, this is kind of my work as a construction architect. I shared this in all our company events as well. So I have been uh, working in a rather large company in Singapore. And the company is RSP Architects. I moved on to WSP Consultancy and also working on rather, rather large projects. So lucky enough to actually have small projects as well. You can see over here, there's a shop house. If you've actually ever been to East Coast Road, there's a, there was a very good um, cafe over there called Fire Make. Um, my most painful project because it was my first project, but also my most memorable project because um, too many screw ups leads to you know, a lot of good memories as well when I look back. So essentially in these projects, I have more than this, but uh, I have been working with all the different stakeholders and my question to myself very often is, you know, when I'm dealing with the, the pen and paper process and um, how difficult it was to actually be able to communicate. And um, a, a lot of times you can see there's a lot of communication tools around. There's WhatsApp, there's email, but things get very disorganized. And that's kind of like how, um, you know, there's a lot of miscommunications. When there's miscommunications, there's delay, there's... Um, there's some issues in terms of how you want to do your contract. Then there will be things that people disagree on. There will be disputes. And that's kind of the space I fell in when I was an architect because I was running the project from the start to the end. So uh, I'll go through the part where I was actually experiencing having to communicate and present things to the client, get them signed off the design, um, all the way to carrying out you know, submissions to authorities, um, carrying out tender, etc. and you know, all of it, I realized the most important thing that was lacking was, in fact, a streamlined form of communication. That's kind of like what uh, Hubble was headed to doing, to streamline all the stakeholders into one platform and be able to communicate effectively. And so that is why it resonated with me and I moved from doing this to tech. So I want to share a little bit about um, the roles and responsibilities of a construction architect. So uh, if any one of you here, or I hope most of you here are actually from construction, is that um, you go through different stages, right, of um, architecture, or I would say work in the building industry. There will be the design phase where you're being, um, um, how would I put it? You're being appointed by the client or developer, or perhaps you're needed for the job. You carry out the design, go to detailed design, you do submissions to the authority to get them to allow you to start building things. Uh, you go to submission to client to get them to sign off so that you can start calling for tender and you, you carry out a tender documentation and the prep calling for tender you award the tender and then you go to site at site you will have to do some contract administration you will have to do inspections regular site meetings technical coordination and there's just so many things you know that you have to do as a construction architect and this is what I actually define as, you know, all these different experiences you have are actually, you know, hard skills. Hard skills that enable you to do the design, hard skills that enable you to do um, the tender documentation, hard skills that enable you to um, differentiate and identify if quality is um, good or not, and essentially carry out contract administration and, you know, the paperwork part of it. And uh, what I want to share a little bit more about today is, you know, how I actually made this transition and I, but I would say I kind of find uh, space for myself 
um, which is actually, you know, in terms of my experience as an architect, you have a lot of hard skills gain, but you also have a lot of soft skills that you gain. And beyond this, as an architect, if you can see, you know, the graphics over here, it definitely resonates with you as an architect. But kind of like, you know, if you think about it a bit deeper, you actually do a lot of strategic planning, you do requirements gathering, and you drive the brief together with your developers or um, if it's a design build contract together with your, your client, which could be a contractor as well. And you do project management. You definitely have to manage the project. You definitely have to manage your stakeholders. You definitely have to manage time, cost, budget. And uh, another, another one of the key things is design. You have to be able to listen to your users and do you know, user experience design. You have to research. Um, research more in terms of what other people are doing in terms of spaces and the reason why there are changes in terms of like, for instance, public space previously was designed as uh, one square plaza and then how you're actually moving on to uh, making things more uh, fluid in terms of circulation spaces because that's how you want people to mingle, etc. And that's kind of the research you do. And then there's also, you know, you take part in active communications, you take on leadership to lead the team. Um, everybody, in fact, in the in the project team takes on a different role and leads it to a certain extent. And also you have to be you know, an analytical of an analytical mind. So I would say, you know, when you gain these soft skills, they actually help in you know, transiting to tech. So from construction to tech, like you know, how do you actually get into tech? So um, before I get into the part where you know how I found this comfort spot for myself, I want to say um, no, do you actually know what you want to do in tech? So in tech, there are actually many different roles. There's why UX, you can do product, the end front end, mobile engineering, QA, etc. And then in the tech firms, there are also non-tech roles, which you could also be interested in, like this ops roles, um, service delivery. And I think one of the very important things when you are actually thinking about jumping to tech is, you know, what exactly is the role you prefer to do and would like to do? That was kind of the question I asked myself because when I was deciding to to make this change and make this jump, I was not exactly specialized in anything that could make a easy transition into tech. So for instance, with my experience as an architect, I would say you know, um, I have some product knowledge and I thought that was what I wanted to transfer over, given that that was my pain point and that's how I actually made this um, switch. So do you actually have transferable skill sets? So earlier I mentioned soft skills are what I term as you know, the most transferable for me to in fact move into the product manager role. Of course, there's a lot of different things that I need to learn, uh, different tools I have to learn as well, different ways I have to deal with internal stakeholders in fact when I actually make this shift to product management. But as long as you see you, know, um, you have transferable skill sets, you can consider it. And if you do not have transferable skill sets, um, it will be helpful for you to take courses in order to equip yourself with the skills that's required for the job. So the next thing is, you know, are you able to put behind your experience and learn afresh? So to have no experience and make a career change, you have to be ready to start fresh and learn from scratch. So you know, when you actually have years of experience under your belt, how ready are you to do that? That you, know, you have to let go of having control. Um, I would say when I worked five years, from first year, I was you know, not really in control to the point where I was really in control of the project and stakeholders. And to actually you know, let all that behind, it was, um, it was I would say, I would call it bravery, but I would call it you know, sometimes you just have to take that one, have that one push to push you into doing something that's out of comfort zone, but something you're interested in. So you have to be ready to make that change. And the next thing is, you know, where do you really start from? Um, I want to share a bit about this because, you know, there's a lot of jobs out there that you see that job descriptions will look interesting, that you'll find that you're interested in because that's what I experienced when I was looking for a job. So you will see job descriptions that you do not fit well in. And so um, what exactly do you want to do when you do not fit into these job descriptions? For me personally, I felt this, that... Um, there are a lot of companies in terms of product management. They are looking for associate product manager roles. You can start off from those. But they also you know, prefer to look for people with a CS related degree. And there are many jobs out there that will also be a product management role fresh that they would hire, but they actually want to hire an MBA grant. 
So for me personally, I actually did consider if I was not able to find a job in product management, perhaps I will go back to school, which is what uh, Ashanta shared earlier as well. So I gave myself a bit of a timeline to decide, should I just be finding a job here? Or, you know, should I just, if CS related degree is not for me, should I go for a master's again and have two master's degree, which doesn't make sense because financially it doesn't make sense, right? So uh, for me, what I would recommend is actually to look at your current industry experience as well as your interest to see where you're interested to apply in. And one of the things I find that's very uh, necessary to have is some form of interest when you're transi transitioning into a new role because there should have some form of basis for you to fall back on to say you have reasons as to why you're pushing on as well as your reasons why you're here because you are able to contribute. And I will take this example, for instance, if you are playing a lot of games um, and you actually are interested in the gaming industry, you understand product market fit, and you know, perhaps that's where you want to be going, rather than, for instance, you just want to jump into any tech company, you go into e-commerce, but you have no idea what you're doing, you have no interest in a particular space, for instance, e-commerce, it would be, it wouldn't, I wouldn't call it impossible, but I would say it would be less exciting for you to see things come to life. And then um, my last question for this is actually, you know, are you actually trying out or committed to going up, um, going all out and far in this new role? So I would say there's nothing wrong with trying out, and but you know, when you're transitioning to a new role, it is very important to adopt a committed mindset. Reason being that uh, you, as compared to other people, you have experience in your previous career. So you already have a fallback plan. You should not be afraid to commit at all. So next, you know, how I actually transitioned. So earlier I mentioned that you know, I found Hubble and I was lucky enough to find this job that relates to my experience and interest. So I had a lot of pain points at work that I observed, for instance, like you no know, communication issues, um, in terms of site processes, construction processes, some things are communicated not as well or not documented as well as I would expect. That some information goes missing, there's miscommunication, and there's different things that you know people are not sharing the same view at. So um, I was lucky enough to find this space uh, in between construction and tech, uh, which is construction tech, of course. So that is how I actually um, land up here. But you no, know, I actually applied to another job before that. So I think one of the things I want to share is you know, uh, the reason why I think interest plays a very big role is because of that. So I applied for another product manager role. In fact, it's in gaming because I actually used to play just one game. It was called Maple Story. I'm sure many people will find that you're going back to your high school memories of playing Maple Story. So essentially, I found that you know, at the, when I went for the interview, there was a misfit mainly because I didn't have interest in violent games. I call them adult games because I don't really consider Maple Story an adult game. It was my interest in teenagehood. And I still like it, but it's cute. And I I admit that it will not make me a good fit for the company. So after that, I actually decided to search mainly based on my own interests, my passion, where I would push my um, career best at, which is actually you know, in construction tech, and I ended up working in Hubble. So what exactly do I do as a product manager? Uh, I mean, if you Google product management, very often you'll see this image, which essentially, um, you know, you don't, really specialize in anything but it's very important to know everything even if you're not specialized in it so on the business side you want to be able to maximize product value hence revenues and with revenue you want to be able to grow and do more things and then you grow and do more things again so this process just continues and on the tech end there will be engineers to help you do the coding and you know, help you understand you know, some concepts and logic that are difficult to understand but you should also be able to understand some concept and logic i'm still learning i mean given my one year of experience it's rather difficult to pick up what people are specialized in. But I'm learning, I'm very thankful you know, that you know these two amazing hosts that we have are helping me each day understand um, you know, more things about tech, more things about engineering, so that I can cater my product requirements better. And lastly, user experience. Um, you know, we are the voice of the customer, that's what uh, we always say. And you have to know what the market wants and you have to get feedback for what you have built. So there are many things that you need to do as a product manager. You can actually Google all of this. And I would say it is not exactly a role that you are simply the jack of all trades and master of none. But you need to know what is more than you know, just scratches the surface. For example, one of the things I've learned also is that um, you actually have to play an important role in the Bizops team as well. For instance, you know, what is the marketing message? What should be the 
content in it, what's your value prop for them to sell, and etc. So I want to share a little bit about you know what's the differences in project management in tech. So as compared to um, you know in the construction industry, so essentially uh, the construction is using the waterfall project management um, method. So you actually conclude one phase and move on to another. You don't really go back to the previous phase. And there's a reason for it because you have a fixed project, you have a fixed timeline, and you are just moving forward. Whereas, you know, in tech, you have to be agile. You have to take on an iterative approach in delivering a project throughout its life cycle rather than a linear path. So essentially what you do is you set a broad direction and then you learn and adapt to these conditions. So in one approach, you actually define a target, zoom in on the solutions. You have to be very certain that the target does not move much. Whereas in the other solution, your target moves and you just grow incrementally closer to it to find you know, the product market fit. And I would say this kind of difference, in fact, was rather um, difficult for me to adopt at the beginning because I used to stand on a position where I simply decided something and you know, push, push, push. And push, 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 no feedback, I'll just push. Reason being, you just need to get a job done. And everybody is just trying to finish things in terms of timeline, in terms of medium cost, and you just want to move on to the next project. But it's rather different because there's a life cycle of um, a software product, in fact. And this project works in a very different manner that um, there has to be constant improvements. It's not like, for instance, you define one day that um, this is the end product that you will get and uh, you don't make any improvements to it and you expect it to continue to sustain. It's not a building that will stand there for the next 40 years. It is a software product that can easily get replaced because people ideate better than you. They are constantly iterating to see you know, what's the competitors doing out there and constantly iterating to see you know, what exactly will customers want for me to help them make their experience in this um, software that we build better. So the last thing I want to share is on my challenges. So the truth is there's a lot of challenges, um, many, many. And uh, one of my challenges I faced was actually learning tech and you know, how to get the engineers to understand what I'm saying, given that I didn't understand how to transmit the message over earlier when I first joined. So uh, just to summarize what are the challenges I faced, I would say you know, breaking free from the mentality of um, being project-based. So project-based very often in construction and many other jobs, they are you know, something that you have an end goal, you want to finish your project successfully, you get the payment, you close off the project, say for instance, in three years, in one year, in how many months. And I learned that I have to take you know, the business objective into consideration and as well as the continuity of the project. Since it's you know, one big unending project broken up into smaller projects and I have to get used to this shift, and I have to listen to customer feedback, iterate, it should not end, and there could be new feature requests and the cycle just continues. Another challenge that I face that uh, I, I want to, to touch on, which is the last one, uh, it is on the perspective, having a change in perspectives. So you know, usually as a, as a project manager or in construction, you will just want to give your customer what they want. So, as a customer, you have specific ones when you do something, and then you know, as a as a project manager, you just listen, or you know, as a project architect or design architect, you just listen. You give them what they want, perhaps you know, with some expertise, you make some changes to it, you recommend something else. But um, in tech, it's rather different, such that you listen to what a customer wants, and um, instead of you know just building what they want with some changes, you actually try to see out what is it that the pain points and translate this to know the solutions that you're going to build instead of building the ones. So one thing you always have to know is that you know, your customer does not know what they really want. They just know what are problems. They may not even know what's a problem. You have to help them distill down their problems in order to help them solve them. So with this, I will end my presentation and hand the time back to Wei Yuan to start the discussion. Hey Eunice, thanks for sharing with us your journey as well as I think very very insightful uh, of many many different insights on uh, being a PM. Uh, okay, let me just adjust our panels. Okay, so yeah, uh, definitely agree with uh, I think one of your just like your last slide on the part of yeah, 
he wants cousins to translate the product. And also, Maple Story is really great. I love that too. But that's uh, many, many years ago. <laughs> okay, so I think with that, let's uh, start with our panel for today. Uh, and also, I think from our audience, if you have any questions, do ask them. I think most of you are on YouTube, so just ask them in the chat. Uh, when we see them, you know, we'll try and surface those questions. And so, let's start with, I think, one of the guess, classic questions for people who are looking into transiting from their industries into this industry. Uh, Know, if you guys can share uh, like one of the biggest differences and maybe also i think in just now perhaps we also talked about challenges so if y'all can talk about those that would be great we can start appropriately <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry um i think for me from my original industry in terms of the work that i was doing right the focus was on the final result rather than the engineering bit that was getting to the final result, right? Because I was working in computational architecture. So I could make a product which would solve the problem in two days, but I could spend time to better it, which would solve the problem in two hours. At the same time, the existing problem was taking two years. So it doesn't, it didn't really, uh, I mean, the idea was not to get to the most efficient solution. The idea was to just get to the solution first, which has been the biggest difference now that I've transitioned into software engineering, where the focus is on the software. The rather, the, the problem's gotten inverted now. Sometimes we get so involved in the engineering that we lose focus on the final product or the user that you're targeting, right? For me, I would, I would share a bit on this. So I would say the biggest difference I actually faced was not the challenges I shared earlier on not having to change that mentality of you know, having everything being very uh, fixed timeline or project based. Reason being with a building very often when I'm designing. Um, I have, a, for example, a design stage of six months and I move on to say doing the tender. I can actually refine the design along the way. But you no, know, the the baseline blueprint doesn't really go from there. Whereas in product, it could come a point where, for instance, the competitor comes up with something similar but better, and you actually have to quickly make adopt that shift in order to you know make yourself competitive as well as you know answer to your customers who are paying. You know, why exactly they should continue paying for your product? So the difference for me is really kind of like a mindset shift of um. Not constraining myself to you know, finishing step A, step B, step C, step B, to being able to go back to step A again. Yeah. So it seems like pacing and some sort of mindset shift seems to be a bit of a theme here. And maybe to follow on from that, somewhat related to this question, I think for our viewers, definitely this is something that they will be thinking of as well. When if you're transiting between these two different industries, you know, is it a stressful process? I think so, because uh, you're basically trying to sell yourself to this job that you have no experience in or no validated experience in, right? And then you, you face stress in all dimensions. You face stress in terms of, is my previous experience null and void now? You face stress in terms of, even if I get the job, will I be able to do it? Will I get the job is another thing. Will I be respected? If I do get the job and get the job done, am I going to get enough credit for it? You face stress in all these dimensions when you're doing like a transition, especially when the fields are not, the fields are so far apart. I actually agree with Akshata. I think there's a lot of stress, especially when um, you're going from a point where you have no credentials as someone who's who is in tech would have a degree, they would have no things under their belt and experience, projects they've done that no would definitely put them on a better position to making this transition because they are for them it's not a transition, right? That it's just um, going from one place to another. But for us, you know, it's not just convincing like uh, potential employers, but also convincing yourself that you can do it, which goes back to the imposter syndrome, right? Like um, perhaps you actually you know not predicting yourself enough of what you can do. Um, Maybe I can say over the past few months, I have questioned myself, but you know, usually I have enough self-esteem to come back and say, no, I'm good enough. 
And then I'll tell, I will go and ask you know, my colleagues like Julius, good enough, right? <laughs> Maybe to, to validate myself, to, to feel like, um, no, uh, this transition is not so bad. I am learning so many things. I'm gaining so much more. And you know, I can contribute so much more with the way I gain and the experience I have. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're doing awesome. So good to have you. Um, okay, we have a question from the audience. Um, so we have uh, Eric. Hello. Uh, so it's a question for Eunice, but I think Akshata can take it as well. Uh, so was there a time where you feel that, you know, you have information overload because we are talking alien language in tech? Uh, I would say definitely I have information overload. I would say when I actually first joined Pablo, right, in the first three months, and I think at that point, Julius joined a bit after I have. So it, it was like I couldn't understand what anybody was talking about, maybe because they were uh, all very, I would say they're all very driven. They were very hard, but they're all very techy, and I was the least techy person around. So I was bringing my knowledge and experience from my previous job in, but I didn't know how to translate this into specifications for them. And neither do I understand, do I understand what are they doing and what they are writing about to, and the questions they are giving me in order to streamline this information I have to send it to them. And I would say, you know, it's kind of like, you know, going in parallels like this, you, you can't really converge at that point. And I found it quite hard until I would say it's definitely helpful uh, in this case to have a mentor. And for me, I actually had two in my job. I have Julius and I have another of my colleagues, Simon, who actually guided me through all this you know, information overload phase where I did not, I, I was a bit lost, no matter how much courses and reading I did online, some things just didn't seem to make sense to me. Because theory, right? Theory versus you know, the practical experience. So having mentors and you know, people in the company who are willing to teach and help um, you, guide you through this period of having information overload in this technical details portion would be very, very helpful. Yeah, for me, I think obviously there was information overload. There always is. And uh, I guess a little bit of it uh, got complicated from the fact that a lot of my initial projects were in the research domain where you don't have that big uh, community to support you. And the people who are with you are kind of at the same level of understanding of what you're doing also, right? So over there, I think that helped that when we did have people coming in from computing who can actually take us through uh, some of the technical details better, that helped. Uh, going online and just uh, spamming getting over the fear of Stack Overflow and spamming over there or spamming on Reddit help. Uh, something like Free Code Camp, which I discovered pretty late. I discovered that three, four years into this plugin uh, add-on journey of mine. Uh, Free Code Camp was this whole community of people who were going through full stack development and they had a very active community. And that was the saving grace. Like at that point of time, it's two things in terms of information overload. One is that you're getting confused. Second, you're actually doubting yourself because you think it's your brain that's getting confused and you don't get the simple concept. And then you then you go into this rabbit hole saying, okay, I'll figure this out, figure this out, figure this out. So the community helped neutralize that and you understood that, okay, that person's not understanding this. Maybe I can go to the next thing. I'll just get this thing done first. And I did it once, twice, thrice, the fourth time it probably clicked. Thanks for the answers. I think let's move on to one that's actually slightly related to the context of this question, which I thought was rather interesting. So Paul was asking this question in the chat. Um, how do you handle the acquisition of your skills as a tech professional? So somewhat related to, I mean, not exactly the tech overload, uh, sorry, the information overload part, but maybe also more on in your own time. I think especially in Chata's journey, I think she mentioned about her moving through those many different domains. And as a individual, but before you went into tech, right? How much time do you actually put, you know, have to put in in order to uh, break into this space? Uh, I don't think I planned it out. Like I wasn't, I didn't sit down and say, oh, I'm going to study for three hours a day and I'm going to study programming at the end of my job. For me, it was more going through like different projects, right? 
and uh, say like I was bored at work. I built the plugin. Maybe that took me 20 hours to build. I was preparing for GRE. I built a Chrome extension to look up like meanings. Maybe that took me 10 hours to build. But it was never uh, sitting down and studying. Uh, rough estimate of hours is. I don't know. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to give a rough estimate of hours or months. In terms of preparing for the interviews, though, once I had like a base somewhat, maybe it took me about three months to actually gear myself and prepare for the algorithm system design interviews to actually break into a software engineer role. That's, that's the only point where I sat down and studied. I would say for my case, I actually did plan out to you know, make this transition. So I actually quit my job as an architect. Um, at that point, I had the excuse of, you know, I was going to get married, I was going to be overseas. So I had some time on hand before I was going to come back to Singapore of a period of about three months where I could actually devote my time to figuring out what I wanted to do. And at that point, I was thinking to myself, even my experience in architecture, I actually thought I wanted to go into the tech industry given that you know, I've interviewed in many different places. I've inter interviewed with developers as well because sometimes it's just best to be on top and just scream at people, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so um, at that point, I decided I wanted to join um, the tech industry and I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. So I started um, taking on courses to learn how to um, do some simple coding to do your uh, UI UX and I actually found that perhaps you know um, among all these different things I've been reading and learning product management is the best fit for myself and that's when I tried to read more literature and do courses on product management to equip myself in the event that I got an interview and actually I got an interview before I equipped myself that's why I would say I was up to bed and after that I tried to equip myself before the interview um, in terms of, you know, since I do not have the technical skill related skills, could I actually put all you know, my business sense forward, uh, the user experience design I have in terms of my experience as an architect forward to give myself you know, an edge over my competition. Those are really great anecdotes for both, from both of our speakers. Uh, so it, it seems like there isn't a, I mean, you can go with the traditional approach with something that like software schedule they do every day or courses. Or if we go back, uh, Chata's approach more project space. Uh, if I were to put it, uh, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Yeah, so uh, more projects a space where you find things you are interested in and uh, looking at building tools and learning knowledge in that uh, in that direction. I think those are really really great anecdotes there uh, for those who are looking uh, in terms of transiting in. Uh, all right, so let's go to another question. Okay, so bit of an interesting question that I want to ask here. Uh, and I'm sure uh, viewers out there are also interested to understand uh, as someone who has moved in from uh, another uh, a very traditional industry for, uh, as an architect over to tech, which is uh, somewhat, I would say, more modern, not as conservative. Do you face any form of uh, prejudice, or discrimination when you moved in into this industry? And how do you deal with that or uh, any tips of doing that? I think the industry is pretty welcoming. Like from outsiders, uh, you don't get, oh, you're an architect, you don't know your job. Rather you get, oh, you're an architect, really? And then it becomes like a story to continue on. That's that's 80% of my experiences almost. Uh, the prejudice and discrimination comes from within me, at least in my case, where I am doubting myself about, or I, I used to a lot before. And uh, yeah, I mean, the only minor case, I think the only minor cases I've had is initially when I was probably a student and there was this one time that I tried to, uh, it, it, I don't think it was ill intention, but it was more like I tried to do a computer graphics course because I wanted to do some better rendering in the current software that I was doing. And they asked me that, you know, it's not a Photoshop course, right? It's actual computer graphics. But that was... That that was that I don't think that was prejudice or discrimination. That was just the fact that it's not it's not spoken of uh, too much that fields can actually overlap, come together to make either fields better, right? So it's it was more out of uh, 
not knowing that an interlink existed rather than prejudice. For myself, I would say I didn't face prejudice and discrimination when I was working. At least I was going to Harbour, right? We are still doing something that was related to what I did in my previous career. So it's not so bad. I didn't feel any of it, in fact, when I was working with the colleagues, mainly because they also wanted to find out from me what I was doing. And I would say they are really quite welcoming. I would say perhaps, you know, the prejudice will come when you're actually applying for the job, mainly because, you know, you have to make it through to that round of an interview for people to understand you. Uh, given that you don't have any credentials, and that's the prejudice that I would see that most people would face if they are making a transition to that. How would I deal with it? Um, at the moment, I don't think I have an idea because I'm not on the hiring position, but more like you know, how I could reach out on what I actually did was I reach out on informal methods to get people to know me before they see my resume. So that was, in fact, how I got around. Um, you know, the process of you know, screening through my resume without understanding what I could actually contribute here. Yeah. I'm actually going to add to that point that the prejudice, there's, there, there could be prejudice when you're shortlisting resumes. At the same time, I think a lot of times it does work in your favor because that's what, what that's that one thing that stands out and makes it interesting. Like maybe uh, even if your resume doesn't have a lot, but the person suddenly caught with that PR, and then they're like, okay, maybe I'll just meet this person to see where they're at. Cool, thank you. Uh, all right, we have a question from our sponsor. Uh, okay, so Hassan's question was, um, can you elaborate more about Waterfall and Agile? And um, yeah, like, do, do you see any advantage, disadvantage? How can we use both? Any thoughts? Um, for myself, I do find that to a certain extent, I still you know, adopt the waterfall approach. Reason being, um, at the beginning, I would say I wouldn't term it as, as a startup, but for myself, since I'm actually working on a new product line, um, it's very important to get a push out before you get the iteration done. So um, there are assumptions made and quick validations made in order to make this push, you know, to go from one step to another and lead on to having us launch the product. I think there was, to some extent, a risk that uh, our company and myself have taken to adopt this approach, to proceed with the waterfall approach first, you know, before we decide to iterate. Reason being, um, you don't actually listen fully to what your customer wants, but you listen, you I would say you try to internalize and you try to predict what they want. I would say at this moment, no regrets yet. Reason being, um, in construction, a lot of people are not um, tech savvy unless they are actually doing no computational architecture, parametric modeling. So they actually have no idea what they want. To some extent, you have to take on a prescriptive approach. But uh, moving forward, definitely using the agile approach, reason being um, when users use, they will definitely have feedback. They have started using and they within the first three days, I started having feedback on, you know, can this be better? Can you fit this better for me to print out, etc. And I think um, definitely have to use a mix of both in terms of the stage, but I would define it you know, in terms of the stage of the project. I mean, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's. Uh... Always contextual. Thank you. And uh, a bit of, uh, I guess, a kind of pivoting a little bit. Uh, since we're talking a little bit about processes, right? Uh, do you have any thoughts about, you know, processes that exist in construction that tech is like, uh, uh, we don't know what that is? I remember we used to go on, a, a, I, I did construction project management for my professional practice, and I used to go on site. And there used to be a round table with all the stakeholders from the person who was paying for the project to the architect, electrical engineer, civil engineer, uh, the real estate guy, the landscape architect, that they would bring together all their drawings and try to figure it out uh, on their own. I think sometimes in tech, uh, you have a tendency to go into silos. And that's probably something that could be brought in from the construction industry. 
actually I agree with Akshata, that's kind of the point that I was thinking of as well. Um, in construction, very often, you know, one of those things that you know, Hubble is doing as well is you know, help, help coordination and communication, doing some low-key advertising here on my product. So essentially what, what I think of is um, in construction that we have, you know, this big, big coordination, technical coordination of discussions where you know, different stakeholders come together to discuss, share their points and you know, trash out things. But I find that you know, in the tech industry, very often, I would say no, not everyone's voices are heard, mainly I would say of internal stakeholders. Reason being, um, I would say there will be people who, who are more silent, more quiet. They are most likely, in my experience, the engineers, because I, I would say they are very hardworking people and they take on a lot of shit. So I feel very sorry for them, but I feel that their voices are not heard enough to make it a more collaborative um, experience. And I would say perhaps, you know, the work culture and all that could help to make it a more collaborative experience where they are willing to, you know, trash out their thoughts so that we can always, you know, from the very beginning, find a better way to approach before we, you know, conclude that this is the product we are going to get. Because very often I find that one of the issues I face is um, I've scoped out the requirements, but I do not have enough feedback from the engineers. Perhaps they're very busy, and um, I was not able to gain access to them. Then, um, you know, this coordination, I would say coordination meetings would have been much more helpful in unblocking you know, the things that will come along the way when the engineers are doing the coding. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so maybe to twist that question around. Uh, so what do you think in terms of, uh, in the case of uh, software engineering, what practices do you think can be actually brought back to construction? Faster feedback cycles and uh, post delivery analysis, I think. So uh construction works almost linearly right you start with the design this you you don't like like you uh, like Eunice mentioned it's more waterfall than agile and for good reason because these are long projects with physical impact so you don't really it it the cost of change becomes pretty high somewhere in the middle and then uh at least when i was there one thing i noticed was uh, you deliver the project and you have people living in it, but we don't really go back and learn from the people who are living in it to see what could have been done better. Whereas a retro in software engineering is pretty common. So. I agree with what Ashata has shared. And I think one of the things I actually faced in construction was that, um, you know, after I completed a project, I hand over that deal, I'm so happy, it's over, I don't have to go back to the site again. And um, I would say along the way, if uh, you're in good relations with developers, they'll come back to you with feedback. But there's nothing pretty much I can do with the feedback because the building is live, people are living in it, people are using it, and I cannot iterate on it. So they have to come up with a lot of you know, work around solutions on their own. That um, I feel that in terms, I wouldn't say in terms of you know, processes and approaches of construction, but I would say perhaps the way people think of architecture or you know, perhaps the way people think of technology and architecture in terms of construction, like you know, the building materials and all that could have been changed so that there could be a more fluid approach to you know, making changes to spaces. And that is kind of you know, what I thought could have been made better, more interesting as well. And another thing I also think that could be brought back from you know, Back, back to construction is the very simple thing of um, no internal stakeholders you know, having to speak with each other. I think in construction, very often you're dealing with external stakeholders. Your internal stakeholders are literally um, not heard, reason being they are pointed to draft people who are just working on things for you. Your uh, police ops team just working on things for you. And um, because there's a lot of external stakeholder management, and internal stakeholder management is kind of, I would say, um, neglected to some extent. And I find that you know, in software engineering, however, I mentioned that you know, you know, things could be better coordinated, but in fact, internally in construction, it could also get better as well, given that you know, 
um, in construction, one of the things we don't have definitely is you know stand ups, retros, and spring plannings that you know we meet regularly to catch up internally on processes. We only meet up externally to catch up on what's the project progress and um, the reason why I would say this step perhaps could have been skipped is the time issues and you know, I think you know, if this can be brought back to construction as well to care more about the internal team, um, everyone will be happier in terms of working together. Yeah. I actually thought of another point. I think one thing that the construction industry would benefit from, from the software engineering industry is the concept of open source. Because I think open, open source has really pushed the edges of software development, right? And uh, this collaborative way of bringing knowledge together for mutual benefit, I don't think that it, uh, it's there, but it doesn't uh, exist in that organized fashion that we do in software engineering. Maybe to extend that question a little bit, so how, how would you envision uh, this? sharing of information like the sort of the open source spirit uh, to work in the context of construction would it be more towards perhaps like two sets or tooling that people build for their own companies and sharing with each other uh, it, it guess, could, oh, sorry, it, sorry go ahead oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, i'm thinking more in terms of sharing tools sharing processes having like a central database of uh, at playbooks maybe things that went wrong in a project it's usually all tribal knowledge that keeps is retained within the design studio or the construction company that's doing it. And uh, yeah, it, just opening it up, maybe it's it's a common problem that exists around and could be solved at a larger scale, right? So essentially, I would say, to, to sum up on what Akshata has shared, it's kind of what we also shared you know, in our company even that you know, in construction, everything is very experience-based. So, uh, the older you are, you have more experience, you know more, but it's kind of everything's in your head. Perhaps you share with your company, but not that many people know about it. But no, that can make things so much better. We can collect data, we can transfer this knowledge, and we don't actually need to use files anymore. Especially since you know, the younger generation coming up will definitely not have experience very often, right? And they do not look forward to learning as slowly anymore. So that would be very helpful. Those are really good situations. Hopefully, if one day the open source payment for construction comes out, they will, they will tie it back to this. Uh, okay, so moving on to a di slightly different question. Uh, maybe I'll also extend a little bit while I'm asking it. So the question, I think very simply from the audience, uh, this is a pre-submitted one, is the switch to the tech industry worth it? And maybe to extend the question a little bit further would be, would you think about moving back to the you know, original roles in the future? I haven't eliminated that option and the switch for the tech industry has definitely been worth it for me. I mean, it pays better, but at the same time, it did give me, uh, I think staying in architecture or construction, uh, trying to use that tool that I discovered, which was programming. Uh, it was a good tool, but I had a limited tool set. Coming into the tech industry has allowed me to actually build on that tool a lot more, a lot more aggressively, make it even sharper. So if, if I do ever go back, I feel that now I have equivalent knowledge. Like I'm not going to be using uh, the wrong tool for the wrong thing. Like I, I can actually make a better difference than I would have just staying there. I would say for me, I would not um, rule out the possibility of going back as well. I would say reason being, I have invested a lot of time there to got my registration as well. So um, the switch to that industry, to me actually, in fact, is worth it. I get to see things from a different perspective, not just from um, um, no, from a tech perspective of you know, what can actually be built, how it can actually be built, what is the time and cost involved, but also in terms of like you know, the different collaborators uh, or stakeholders, in fact, um, that are external. So when you're listening to customers, as I would say, you know, my position as an architect, I would take on a different approach to doing things. But when I actually listen to you know, all these other different stakeholders I've always been working with, I realize you know, they have very different concerns. And their concerns are also varied. And perhaps they are even more grave than what I've been looking at previously. 
And I would say I empathize better. So if I actually do switch back to going to architecture, I would say my enemy have more empathy. And also I will bring you know, better practices back in terms of how I have been doing, for instance, you no know, big collaboration and taking on digitizing projects in my previous company. I will have done a better job in that and to help the company switch, to help the company be able to um, adopt better practices of um, being given that I understand what can be done and what can't be done at the moment and how things can be done, what are the workaround solutions better rather than you know, um, constantly be searching on oh, who this help, can I do this? And then getting answers where some of them leads to somewhere, some of them lead to nowhere and you know, constantly be feeling like um, no tech is there but it's not helpful for me but in fact it actually can do so much more. Cool, thank you. Uh, all right, so we have a question for Eunice. Uh, actually, it was part of uh, Eunice's talk. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that in construction, uh, you just decide something and then you push, push, push. What does that mean? So I would say um, it's usually in a point where um, you've gone past the detailed design stage, you have awarded a tender, and somewhere along the construction, or some design issues pop up you actually have to move very fast because the whole site is simply waiting for you to make one decision. And every single day you spend you know, trying to redesign, getting authorities approval, getting the client to approve the budget. It's another additional day lost in you know, construction progress. So very often you have to expedite this entire progress to push through, to get it approved. It may not be the best solution if you look at things in terms of um, totality when you say have um, no six months to design but at that point it was the best decision to move forward in terms of time cost um, uh, regulations and design changes how much you're making on site that is essentially how you just have to move so yeah that's what i mean by you just push 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 i see okay makes sense makes sense totally makes sense and uh, i guess a question to shut as well earlier you mentioned that you know uh, you kind of broken down your long term goals into shorter ones. Do uh, you still have long term goals? How do you plan your career roadmap? I I always have long term goals. That's a different matter that it never works out and I end up in a whole different place. Well, <laughs> well I recently, but I've started, I've stopped focusing on that too much. I recently read this book by James Clear, uh, Atomic Habits. And he's talking about having a vision, but then fixing your trajectory, right? So uh, say I have a vision that I want to be, uh, I want to get up to the next level in my software journey, but I can't, it, it's too far into the future for me to actually plan back steps. So I can just think about the next two things that I can do tomorrow and today that's along the same trajectory. Maybe it's not, maybe it's reading an article, maybe it's not the same stack as what I am doing right now, but it does it help me become a better engineer. So yeah, I will go ahead and read it. And that's how I started planning instead of trying to do like a linear, there was a time in my life where I was actually using construction project management software to map out like different things that, oh, I have a one year plan and then have like milestones and then I have like dependencies because I was playing around with that construction project management software. But yeah, I, uh, I've realized that uh, at least in real life for personal goals, it doesn't work. So I've started taking it more real time and trajectory oriented. Hmm, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take another question from the audience. Uh, so a bit more maybe contextual to today's lineup events uh, as part of the IWT lineup of all, all these events for this one month. So do you guys have any tips to give uh, first for those who are looking at entering tech, uh, this entire industry in general? Uh, in general or those in looking to enter tech? Uh, is in any, like, like not just the construction, like, uh, or like, you know, streaming from PT or Harbour in terms of construction, but, you know, tech industry as a whole. Uh, I, I think mine is more general in terms of uh, just just be brave and be okay to fail. I think for, uh, for women, I've noticed that we're very scared to fail. And we like to get things perfect. So 
it stands true for any industry, for tech industry, I think the, because there's this whole aura around scent fields, uh, maybe the barrier is a bit more. So just be okay with failing and that would work. I think for myself, I would say that, you know, for girls looking to do STEM, I would say, you know, actually in tech architecture falls under STEM as well. Um, you have to definitely be brave enough to go against what you know, people normally think of as, you know, for guys, guys in STEM, right? The guys are better at it. You have to validate yourself very often without having um, someone else validate you, of course. Because I would say, you know, being insecure is something that will be your downfall if you are actually not um, uh, good enough at something. Very often, I would say girls, as mentioned by Akshanda, want to be perfectionist and it's very difficult to, to get around a point where you say, you know, I'm good enough at something. And um, celebrate International Women's Month, I would say one thing I would say, you know, everyone just be confident, be confident and you know, just go all out. You know, it's okay to fail. You know, sometimes you feel you don't even know you feel. Sometimes you did not feel you also don't know that you have succeeded. You just need to keep on switching. And I guess that is what will make a difference to you and your career. Yeah. It makes the success sweeter once you fail. Very great tips from uh, from both our speakers. Maybe just to extend this question a bit further as well. Uh, if we swap uh what's that called? goes into people who are looking at entering uh, the tech industry, what tips would you give uh, this other group of people as well? Solve your own problems. I, I think the tech industry is very unique in that way because when we are doing tech, we are actually solving problems for all other domains. I mean, I'm, I'm working for a tech company, but it's actually the domain is media. Uh, you're working for a tech company, your domain is construction. So it's, it's an allied field that can be uh, applied almost anywhere. It's just a tool. And if you take it with that mindset, you don't even have to wait for six months to train yourself. You can just start applying it wherever you are and then find a way in. Yeah, maybe I would like to add a bit. So uh, for anyone who's looking to enter the tech industry, um, I would say don't be afraid. Don't be afraid for a very simple reason. Uh, I'm not saying you, know, you may fail, you may not fail whatsoever, but don't be afraid because uh, you no know, tech is growing. There will be a space for you as long as you try hard enough. See, there's a space for me, right? <laughs> and these kind guys here have also accepted me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so again, uh, those are really awesome answers. So we have reached the uh, last question of time that we have for today. Uh, I think let me just take the opportunity here and also uh, on behalf of Julius as well to thank both of our speakers uh, today, you know, for gracing us you know, to take your time to share your experiences in an entire like, long journey that you've undertaken towards where what you have achieved today. So we are very excited to see you know what you guys are going to be achieving over the next uh, couple of years, next decades as well. Yay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so thank much you for so being much. part of this show. Thank you for organizing. Yeah, thank and you for having for, us. And supporting us. I think both of you have served as validators for both Yonis and me in our respective companies. Yes, definitely. I would say one thing, one thing definitely to you know, people who are looking to transit transition to tech, right? Is that no don't don't be afraid. There will be kind guys around like Julius and Wayan who will help you understand things, they will help you validate things. As as is you know everyone transitioning from one space to another. There will be colleagues out there to help you. Don't have to be afraid that you will you know be thrown into the deep end of the sea. Nobody's gonna help you, no everybody's gonna leave you lost and then you will just leave. It is not like that. You, it's only like this when you think about it before you enter it. It certainly makes sense. Thank you, thank you. We will treat you lunch someday. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, 
we're reaching the end of uh, today's event. Uh, I think just to uh, talk a little bit about uh, in the coming months for other events we're going to be having. All right, so uh, first, uh, just to share, you know, focus our social links uh, in relation to the events that we're going to be doing in months to come. So uh, make sure you check out our uh, website over here. You know, we we'll always put the latest event that's going to be coming soon on the homepage as well. So if you're interested uh, in, you know, seeing events like you know, what we have been doing today, uh, make sure you check that out. Uh, also, our Facebook, where we are always uh, keeping updated on all these different events that we'll be doing. All right, and yeah, we already have speakers lined up over the next two months. Uh, immediately for next month itself, or rather, in fact, this month, uh, we're going to have Bruce back again. Uh, some of you all might have remembered him uh, speaking for an event that we had, I think, somewhere in September of last year. And he gave really great insights during the QA we had for that event. So really excited to have him here again for a different topic this time in terms of scaling your own career. So if you're an engineer and you're looking at building your career, I think this is something that, uh, that you shouldn't miss. You know, Make sure you watch, uh, watch out for these events and updates we have on our events uh, on Facebook. Okay, And also, another topic that, uh, because we'll release more details on this in time to come, but make sure you watch out for this as well. Very great insights from Anastasia from Disney. So, uh, yeah, we'll be putting more details on this on our Facebook page. And we're always looking for speakers. I mean, if you are working for a company or you know you have been uh, contributing to you know, some open source solution, uh, you know uh, you want to share some of the knowledge with the community. You know, do write in to us, uh, especially if you're using all these different Google technologies, you know, using Chrome, Kotlin, uh, you know, using Google Cloud. Just uh, go to this link. Uh, tell us uh, more details about you know, what you want to share. And we'll get in touch with you. Uh, try and put you in to you know, some of our events uh, you know, within the coming months as well. Okay, and uh, last but not least, uh, you know, social stuff, great stuff. Uh, times like this makes me like want to be a YouTuber, and I'll say like, share, and subscribe. But I do that too often. So, <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, make sure you check out all our different social links. And uh, as mentioned just now, I think our website and Facebook are the two of the more important ones. We usually keep that uh, very much updated. Uh, Facebook, especially if you uh, usually browse, uh, like watch for our events on Facebook, you know, usually we'll put all our event updates, you know, dates, or you know, release details. Like just now I mentioned about Anastasia, you know, we're going to release our details in regards to those events there as well. Uh, and yeah, I think that's all we have today. Uh, make sure, you know, since you're on Facebook, like, share, subscribe this video. Uh, it will help us a lot. Uh, yep. So see you guys next time.